Good morning. Thanks very much for having me. Um, first, I'd like to thank the Clay Brick Association for having me here this morning, giving me the opportunity to speak. As uh, Niku's just said, we've got about 20 minutes, which is fantastic, because originally it was 10. So to get through it all in that short space of time was going to be a little bit difficult, and this way I can hopefully field some questions at the end if there are any. So today, we're just going to run through, um, I'm going to give you a brief history of the kiln. Obviously, it's family name, so there's a bit of connection there. Uh, some of the design benefits, a project we've been working on in South Africa today with uh, Worcester Buxton. Uh, economic benefits, environmental and social, and then going forward from there. So we'll start with the history. Uh, the kiln was first built 89 years ago. It was invented by my grandfather in 1927 in Germany, uh, Alois Hablet, German engineer. <coughs> so between the years of uh, 27 and 61, he put 150 brick kilns on the ground throughout the, um, the developed world. As you can see here, there's one of first kiln in England in 1929, and then Knoxville, Tennessee in uh, 1936. A lot of people may ask, why did it cease production, you know, such a commercially successful operation? Well, the reason being that the family moved to Australia and uh, in the developed world we had this extreme increase in labour costs. As a result of that, more automated technologies became favoured and the tunnel film came into place there, which is fantastic technology, and pushed out the smaller operators, which is what happened with the, uh, the Havler kiln. Coming forward to 2015, uh, quit my job and I thought we'd try and reignite the flame again. There's a lot of interest in South Africa and the global market in brick kilns. There's about 300,000 kilns in the world uh, that could do with various improvements. Also a fantastic thing about South Africa is that uh, it's got the capacity of the developed world, however, still the developing world constraints. So for a technology like Hadler Zigzag Kiln, it, uh, it really, it's an ideal marketplace for it to sort of thrive. Going to the design benefits. So the kiln has a very small uh, footprint for its output. It's about sort of 15 wide by 20 long, or about 300 square metres. So it's really not taking up a hell of a lot of space. And for what it does, it's extremely efficient. Of a kiln that size, which you call a 16 chamber, the one we put in at Worcester Buckstein, that does between 25 to 30,000 bricks per day, or solid units. However, if you were to have the appropriate green brick preparation, you could. Uh, have some sort of perforation, say 20%, and then once again your brick production capacity would go up. There's also the option to have numerous kilns on the ground for operators if they want to do larger scale, and you can sort of tailor that with market demand, as opposed to having a highly capital intensive outlay for a large project, which you've got to pump them through the whole time. You could have a number of kilns, it could shut down, varying on what the, uh, the market's dictating to you. And then obviously there's varying models available. Now this is all in relation to the levels of automation or manual operation. So, and that scales with costing of the kiln. Further to that, it does have a drying system as everyone asks. Now that's one of the big things with more traditional kilns. People are at the mercy of the elements. And come the winter months, kilns sort of shut down pretty much for a lot of these people. And all the stocks are bought out. So with the Hubble Zigzag Kiln, pending, I mean, pending your clay brick preparation, uh, you can put bricks inside the kiln and dry. There's obviously a few caveats attached to this. I mean, you know, the structural integrity of the brick. For example, if you're extruding a brick with 20% moisture content, it can hardly hold its own form. When setting it in the kiln, there's no way that you'll be able to, um, well, it won't hold its structural integrity in the bricks above it, so that wouldn't work. However, um, it's something that is really a, a unique design feature of the kiln. So basically, the residual heat is pulled ahead of the fire zone and hits those green bricks set in the chamber. Um, from there, the, uh, and that also incre increases your fire progression and speed. Now the zigzag name, that comes from, as I'm sure you, there's, all, there's replications of zigzag kilns around the world, but the original is my grandfather's invention. Um, so basically what we do is, you set the bricks, they're stationary in the kiln, and the fire moves through the bricks. So bricks being the heaviest product, why not put it in there when it's green and take it out when it's a saleable product and put it on the back of the truck as opposed to moving it, the fire moves around it. With the use of various uh, flues and ducting networks, we have a fantastic draft coming through the kiln. Now this alleviates any issues with dead corners. Sure, there can still be issues if you're just using internal fuel, but there's top-up points on top of the kiln to alleviate these also. Once again, the zigzag allows for like maximum combustion with the fuel source you're using. 
and, uh, and you can use a varying array of fuels too. And obviously the clays that you can fire, because it's a longer fire progression, you can use more sensitive clays. So in short, we look at the kiln here, it's, um, you can see it's about 15, sort of plan view, 15 wide by 20 long. You can see the colour coding there, and that's the fire moving in an anti-clockwise direction. So you've got eight wicked doorways, or access egress points, where the bricks come in and out of the kiln. So this travels around an anti-clockwise direction, and you constantly chase the fire, feeding, emptying, feeding, emptying, moving around. Um, there's a small exhaust outlet. I mean, really, the exhaust should be very little, as Julian pointed out before. Hopefully no smoke coming out of the kiln. It's all utilised, and the temperatures will be quite low coming out of the stack itself. Further design benefits, uh, because of the unique induced draft, and we've used a, a bifurcated fan in the Worcester Buck scene example, you get a consistent quality brick. So you're no longer gambling, it's not, you're not at the mercy of the elements. Um, you've got even fewer, even shrinkage, and significantly less waste. Now I've said less than 5% here, which is extremely achievable. For our financial models, I've used a far more conservative figure, and we're still getting fantastic returns on the product. Um, also, a big one is the kiln operator controls the fire, not the other way around. So you're really in control of what's happening inside the kiln. If you want to slow it down, speed it up, that sort of thing. <coughs> it's ergonomic and worker friendly, so comfortable, clean, safe working conditions. Compared to the older methods of making bricks, it's a uh, forklift, as you can see here. This is actually the Worcester Buckstein application. So brick kiln driving in, then bricks are set. Uh, <coughs> Because it's all ground level work, there's no need for workers to get up on ladders, platforms or scaffolding. It's all working hard, set at about 1.8 metres. Obviously the roofing structure, I said this is a design benefit. As you saw in the previous photos, the historical ones, they all had a roof on the top. So that means your brick season can go all the way through, improves the, the um, operation working conditions for the kiln workers, reduces your down, work, down days and uh, you don't have that dip in the winter months. So the time in South Africa to date, I haven't, I haven't even been in the, well, the first time I came to South Africa was less than a year ago, and at the start of last year it wasn't even on sort of my radar to get over here. But in, uh, in May last year, with some assistance from Swiss Contact, I first had uh, a phone call from John Bullstead by Skype, and he said there's lots of interested operators out here, and you should really get across and have a chat to them. So in May, less than a year ago, flew out here and we held workshops in uh, Gauteng and the Western Cape, at which a few of you were there and I recognised some faces. And from there we pitched the project. Uh, what we'd like to do is put the technology back on the ground. In the Western Cape workshop, I met Niku Murray um, from Worcester Buckstina and basically shook his hand and said, look, we're going to make this happen. Flew back to Oz worked like crazy, and then came back in September where we had the pre-project signing. And then I went back home again. So in this one here, just big thanks to Swiss Contact for setting up that initial meeting and, uh, and facilitating with doing that, or the EECB project. We moved to November last year. So we broke the, that's Niku in the background there with the excavator. December, we poured the kilns foundations and then as you know in South Africa everything moves pretty slowly December months and early January. So a bit of a stall on things. January the external walls went up. Uh, February we put a roofing structure over the top of the kiln and then March we uh, put the kiln innards in. So all the HZK internal kiln components made up of dampers, hot air flue ducts and that type of thing. Now we're into April. Uh, these photos were taken just the other day. So you can see we've completed it. Uh, we didn't commence operation because of this event. We thought best that Nico and I don't run away, set fire to the thing, and hope that it's all still working when we come back, which it will be. Um, so next week's the big week for it. Moving on to the economic benefits. So there are many economic benefits attached to the kiln. I mean, the big one is, I think, the short implementation period. As I said, I haven't even been in the country a year. We've built a kiln on the ground source procurement in foreign space and uh, at times it can be very difficult to get ball rolling and have a few issues. Um, but really I think we can do it in 12 weeks. I've got a program that says I can do it in 10, but if you give me three months you could put one on the ground and have it operational. So four months you'd have a working kiln. 
It's got an extremely low capital cost and the payback period is also very attractive. Minimal maintenance costs because it's such a simple mechanism. Uh, and you obviously decrease your fuel bill, fuel, fuel bill significantly and decrease your waste equals higher commercial product and then meet your government regulation. As uh, Nick was said earlier, January next year you've got the carbon tax coming in. When I was here previously in May last year, they said March this year. So it is coming, it's getting closer, and from my calculations, it's eight to nine months. So everyone will pay, but depending on what scale. So looking at the kiln now, this is, this is the juicy one that everyone wants to know about. Um, so I've said approximately 4.5 million rand. Now this is based on the Worcester specification here. So this includes all the construction costs attached to it. Um, the automation, which is to a quite a high standard, it's a big electrical package, pneumatic jacks and dampers, PLCs, VSDs, um, <coughs> the proprietary components and the consultancy services attached to that. So that's all the engineering and design that goes into it, uh, the project management fees on the ground. And then obviously we want to, going forward, there'd be some business model development. But if we look at the costs broken down there, there's certain line items which, as brick makers, you could automatically strike out some of those costs. <coughs> so the bricks and masonry, 13%, you can do the sums yourself, you could strike that out of there. If you have a roofing structure that would be um, appropriate for the kiln, it can, it's, just, it's just a covering mechanism to keep the rain elements off and extend your working season. So once again, I've costed that in there. Another attractive thing with it is looking at finance mechanisms. Um, let's go back one. The big four banks in South Africa, we've currently got one of them involved in the project and they're financing part of it. Uh, pending the monitoring results coming in the next few months, they'll be looking to get behind things like this as part of their mitigation strategy for climate change. So there really is finance available for these sort of projects. Um, now, as I said, we've used extremely conservative figures based on the payback period and the financial model. So on the wastage saving, I've used about 10%. I said 5 there, but I really think we could get it down to sort of 1%, if not less. Conservative energy saving, we've taken 25 as our model there. However, I really think it's going to be much more in the way of 50. So once again, this two-year period is sort of doing this. Further than that, you have... Um, the carbon credit generation with the pending carbon tax coming in. So this gives you an additional optional revenue stream on top of your So every ton you reduce, there's a, there's a benefit attached to it. And we have somebody working on the team, uh, Anil Butter, who you might have met last year. He works in the uh, say clean technology expert in the carbon markets. He's done projects in South Africa, works with the UN, and more recently worked with the Standard Bank. So that's something we could assist in setting up also. Further to that, environmental and social benefits um, obviously reduces your greenhouse gas emissions, upskills your workforce, and improves the working conditions significantly. And then to summarise, it's, uh, it's a proven technology. I mean, there's a long history of commercial success there, and we're sort of reinvigorating it now with some 21st century updates. It's got extremely attractive economics. We can provide a turnkey solution, so literally come in, get it done in a very short time frame short construction time frame, as I said, meet your environmental, social and regulatory requirements. It's simple operation. It's really, it's a simple, cost-effective solution. Going forward from here, as I said, we haven't yet lit the kiln, um, but we're going to be refining that process in the next couple of months, with the monitoring taking place probably late June. And then come July, uh, we'd like to get people on board to come and have a look at the kiln, hold a, a day where we can talk to operators or potential uh, clients who would like to maybe adopt the technology and look at doing things like that. We've also got um, looking at South African partnership or an agent here because as you know being from somewhere else I want someone who speaks the local language if I'm not here all the time and uh, can relate and understand and knows the market so that's a big one for implementation of a foreign technology. Further than that, I'd like to say a big thank you. Um, first of all, to the Clay Brick Association for having me here to speak today. A big one to Swiss Contact. They've uh, helped facilitate my being here. And then a big one to Niku Murray for giving us the opportunity at Worcester Buckstein. <coughs> thank Thanks very much. Cheers.